please welcome Professor of Law Jane Kay from the University of Oxford. Jane is the director of the Center for Health, Law, and Emerging Technologies. She is a truly innovative legal scholar, and she's one of the global leaders in the field of uh, ethics, law, and society related to genomics. Please, Jane. Great. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, it's an absolute delight to be here. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. I think that uh, it's a great privilege to be here at a time when the Nordic countries are thinking about new ways of approaching personalized medicine and the way that they can work together. So what I'm going to talk about today is really how we can use digital technologies to address some of the challenges raised by personalized medicine. And so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the challenges, not just in personalized medicine, but kind of in research generally and in clinical care to some extent. What are the challenges of obtaining consent in these new contexts? What is dynamic consent? And how does dynamic consent provide one solution to some of these challenges? So, what are some of the challenges that we're seeing that are really being raised by new technologies to some extent? So we're seeing that what the important issue is about flows of data and data going to the right places, data being used for multiple choices. As well as that, we're seeing that big data approaches are going to be something that will just become routine in terms of how we do research. And the Concerns about that is how we actually bring society along board with us as we start to integrate data from different data sets. What are, their, what are the social expectations? What do people want in terms of being able to uh, decide how their data is being used? As well as this, we're seeing that um, people are able to collect data themselves. So we're seeing that uh, M health approaches are um, becoming more prevalent, that uh, in developing countries, more people have mobile phones than can actually access a doctor, so that you're seeing really innovative approaches to the use of data. But this also raises questions about how we use that data. How can we actually bring it into the mix in terms of using a wide range of data sets. So we're also seeing huge advances in terms of genomics, and all of the people in this room know some of the challenges that raises. First of all, we have um, data which is actually relevant for a range of individuals, not just the individual, but their family as well as groups and communities. And secondly, um, people are actually uh, having their DNA sequenced through outside companies, so outside of our um, healthcare domain, so with um, different kinds of companies. And companies such as Ancestry.com um, are actually really important in this field. So people are able to bring their sequence data into the clinic on a stick. But also, I think we're having a, a challenging um, of the paradigms because we can use individual data or population data to inform both inquiries. And I think we haven't really seen this in this way before, and genomics actually opens up these challenges and these possibilities. And of course, the, the thing that we need to do more than ever is to share data sets across the world and build collaborations across the world so we can get better insights into um, diseases. So what are the challenges of obtaining consent? First of all, we've got changing law. Legal requirements vary between countries and will change over time. And I was very heartened to hear that as part of this Nordic approach, there's going to be an inquiry into some of the legal uh, barriers to actually sharing data between countries. But we've also got different domains. So we've got different rules for research and for the clinic. And these vary um, between these two domains. As well as that, we have different requirements for samples and data. 
So different legal regimes apply to samples and data, which leads to complexity and a double regulatory burden. And we really haven't teased this out or, or got a good solution to this, though um, more and more um, genetic data is being seen as a data uh, set that actually um, encompasses... Uh, sorry, uh, genetic data is being seen as data rather than actually being um, seen as coming under a samples regime. The other challenge we have are that the measures for obtaining consent are paper-based, and they're usually at the beginning of the research process. So this has meant that we've got an over-reliance on broad consent for a range of research purposes. And it's very difficult to sustain that when we have so many different uses of, firstly, existing data, but also the collection of new types of data and bringing that together. And I think this really raises a number of privacy concerns. The other issue is that quite often what happens in this complex use of data is that we get expert committees standing in the shoes of individuals. And so research committees make decisions on behalf of participants, People do not always know how their data is being used. And this really isn't in the spirit of data protection law or privacy law. And so I think this is really problematic, particularly if we've got data that's being shared by a number of research projects. The sixth thing about our current uh, governance framework for research and uh, translational research, is that quite often people become invisible. And I think it was quite interesting to hear Louise's um, presentation about how um, uh, Sally Davies had been saying that, in actual fact, uh, we really need participants to be involved. This is a good thing. But also that um, we had um, a patient saying how he presented a different view and how important that was. And I think at the moment, we're not really capturing that. Um, we don't recognise that patients have valuable experience about their condition that could benefit the research, or potentially they could be co-producers of knowledge. And I think this is a huge area that um, we could potentially explore far better. The other issue is clinical relevance. So we have genetic information that has implications for individuals, families, groups, and uh, communities. But also, we don't have easy mechanisms to feed that information back. So Kari mentioned that currently in Iceland, it is unconstitutional to feed back results to women who have breast cancer. We can't allow that to continue. We really need to do something about this and have frameworks that enable that. The other thing, and it came out last night over dinner, the issue about trust, how the use of data in this way has the potential to undermine trust. And what we need to do is really understand social expectations about the use of data. But also, we need to develop governance mechanisms that reflect that. So quite often, people um, say that patients want their data to be shared. But in actual fact, there's a number of um, obstacles to doing that. So how can we change that paradigm so that, in actual fact, data is shared if a person wishes it to be shared, but that it can be controlled if they choose. So this leads me to dynamic consent. So dynamic consent is a, sorry, is a personalised digital interface to enable greater participant engagement in clinical and research activities over time. So crucial to that is engagement. It's dynamic because individuals can give different kinds of consent, so they're not limited to a broad consent. They can change their consent preferences over time, receive information on the progress of research, enrol in new studies, and engage in self-reported research. 
So an example of um, a project which has implemented dynamic consent is the Rudy study, which is being led by uh, Kasim Javid at the University of Oxford. And so this is a study into the rare diseases of the bone joint and vessels. It's online, and people can sign up to uh, be involved in this clinical research study. So... People sign on um, as much uh, as uh, like you do through banking or shopping. Sorry, I'm not sure what that noise is. Um, and, but also they can receive um, information on how their information has been in, used in research. So they can um, receive uh, details about the papers that have been published using their data but also uh, they can actually contribute surveys on quality of life and actually receive findings back on that. So the consent mechanisms that we have enable um, a number of uh, consents to be broken down. So this is a granular consent process so that you can actually um, have some consents which are mandatory to enable individuals to be involved in the study, but other things that can be carried out at a later date. So in terms of samples, you can actually um, break this down so that um, uh, you can have it that uh, uh, surface tissue can be re removed and used by researchers as part of this study. So there's a number of things here that people can actually choose whether they want to be involved in. And one of the things that uh, we have sort of separated out is genetic research right at the bottom. So as you can see, individuals can choose what their preferences are there, and they can go back later and change those preferences if they so choose. It also means that um, they can uh, choose how they want to be contacted, uh, whether by a letter, telephone, text message, by email, and, and when and how they would like to be updated on the progress of the study. As I said before, it also enables people to fill out surveys, and we're increasing the number of surveys which have been put on the site. So um, uh, basically, um, the green ones are when people have completed them. Uh, amber means they're half completed, and blue means they still need to be completed. But people have their own um, list of to-do, and basically they get a prompt uh, to fill out um, surveys. But the, the benefits of this is that they actually can monitor, for instance, their pain levels and understand how they've changed between surveys, a survey that was done six months ago and how that might be now. So the Rudy project actually um, provides a translational pathway. Um, uh, as you can see, it, can, it starts with the patient who can either come in through a clinician or actually accessing the website. Um, they can um, then... Uh, 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 import information, uh, quality of life questionnaires, their timelines, and now we've got a new facility where they can actually record all of their um, uh, prescriptions and also their visits to hospitals and interactions with uh, clinicians. This is then all available for research. So you've got clinical data going in, as well as any other data that um, is being uh, developed. And then this is actually uh, approved by the Rudy Access Committee if a clinician or a researcher um, wants to be involved. We've put a question mark with patient just because we don't know um, how, how we would deal with that, and I think that's very controversial. Potentially, this means that this system actually can go back to individuals with the results of tests. We haven't tested that yet, so it's something that we want to build in, but we haven't done that, and that's why those arrows are um, not uh, in solid uh, lines. So you can see that this actually potentially has, uh, could actually link up some of the concerns that we've had um, with personalised medicine and the issues that have been raised by its implementation. So what are the benefits of um, dynamic consent? 
Firstly, it meets the highest international and ethical and legal standards for consent in a world where data protection laws are in flux. And so we know that the um, general data protection regulations are coming in. They have higher standards for consent. We know that um, this is going to have implications in terms of research, mainly because a lot of the research provisions are going to be um, uh, given to member states to write. But we've, if you have consent, you are meeting the highest standards. It's also dynamic because different kinds of consents can be given by participants at different times in the translational um, process. So rather than having that consent right up front, you can actually spread it out over time. It also enables choice. People can set their own privacy preferences and know how their information is being used. It's tailored. It's tailored to how... Um, participants want to be contacted and when they are uh, contacted, enabling active involvement if they desire. It enables ongoing communication and engagement throughout the lifetime of research so new consents and samples can be attained, which means that it's efficient. It simplifies and streamlines consent and recruitment processes, making them more responsive to changing circumstances. And of course, it can be customised. So it can be customised to each research enterprise to see, suit the needs of researchers and the study population. So potentially you could ask for a broad consent for low-risk epidemiological study, but then an explicit consent for um, a blood draw or other, um, other kinds of involvement in research. And it provides transparency. Participants and researchers know how samples and data are being used. So in conclusion, dynamic consent and a digital um, platform, I think, addresses the inefficiencies of paper-based physical consent interactions. It provides the technical means to obtain a granular consent at various points along the translational pathway, meeting different legal requirements. It enables decisions made locally, uh, locally to be respected globally. It has the potential to recognise the physician-researcher-patient relationship as co-producers and provides a tool for ongoing communication and engagement. And finally, it promotes translational research by bridging the divide between the clinic and research, a key thing that we need to address to enable data to flow. So I just wanted to... Um, acknowledge the work of my team at Helix, in particular Harriet Teer, but also I just have started a new part-time professorship at the University of Melbourne, and also um, my uh, colleague Kasim Javid and the Rudy team, the Wellcome Trust and our other uh, funders, and I just wanted to direct you to our paper on dynamic consent. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Jane. And as you know, inspired by your research and the close collaboration we're so fortunate to have with you and your team, uh, the ELSA group of the Norwegian Cancer Genomics Consortium suggested a national research platform for dynamic consent uh, two years ago in the uh, no uh, Journal of the Norwegian Medical Association. So we hope to see that someday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.